um, you're in a very scary situation. Do you notice how your body responds in scary situ situations? Maybe it's you get both cold and hot at the same time. You get sweaty and you feel like you can never warm up. Maybe your nose starts to tingle, maybe you start to sweat a little bit, and your body is naturally trying to figure out how do I get out of this situation? Now, physiologically, they sort of label those defense mechanisms as fight or flight. Now, there's also one that's come up recently, freeze. So if you're in a very scary situation and you just kind of freeze, you don't know what to do. Otherwise, you might try and get out of there or maybe even try to find a way to fight your way free. Now, these defense mechanisms that our bodies have are good things because they're trying to help us. They're trying to figure out how do I survive? And last week, there was a fight or flight or freeze or an additional fourth one that we could say, freak out or fall apart. When Isaiah is confronted with the very presence of God, he freaks out because he realizes that he is unclean. And our passage this morning is going to deal with that very same situation of in a fight or flight scenario, what do you do? Specifically, what does the king of Judah do? And as we prepare to hear the readings this morning from Isaiah 7, we want to remind ourselves of this narrative tension that runs all throughout the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. How is God going to keep his promise to fix what is wrong in this world? Because God loves this world. And we want to remember that the Bible starts in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, not chapter 3. God loves this world. He has created everything good and human beings as his image bearers. So how is God going to fix what is wrong in this world when the very people he has chosen to be a light to the world, a blessing to the world, turn out that they have just as many problems as everybody else. They are just as messed up. They're, instead of being a light to the world, they are bound in the same darkness as everybody else. And Isaiah, we've seen so far, that God's very own people, his kings and his rulers are corrupt. His priests enable empty worship where people can get to kind of just come and do their religious thing, but then they go and they live their life, they abuse each other, they take advantage of the poor, they use their bodies however they want rather than how God has designed them. The priests enable this, and the people themselves are faithless. And when the Bible talks about a people being faithless, it doesn't just mean they don't have intellectual assent towards something. They very well could have, have believed in God, but they had no allegiance. Their hearts were far from God. So the kings were corrupt, the priests were corrupt, the people were faithless, and even his prophet realized that he too, the very one who called the nation to repentance, he, he needed it too because he was unclean. And he realizes, even part of his mission, that, that as much as he's going to call these people to repent, they're not going to. God tells him, it's like the worst job description possible. As much as you tell them to repent, they're not going to, and I've actually planned it this way. That as much as you talk, they've already decided in their minds that they're not going to listen to you, so they're just going to get harder and harder in their hearts. And we talked about it in our Sunday school about how there's this really interesting tension. Like, why, why would God do that? And it reminds us of that story in the book of Exodus where God hardened the Pharaoh's heart. But all God was doing was hardening something that was already hard. And so I think maybe in our Sunday school today, maybe we'll talk some more about this. So there's this narrative tension that runs th all throughout the Bible, which jumps on top of another narrative tension about this idea of a test. That when somebody is confronted with something, a challenge from God to either obey God and follow him, or to do what is right in their own eyes because maybe they see something that looks better than obeying God. 
You think about that story in Genesis 3 where the man and the woman saw that the fruit was good and they took it. There's this narrative tension that runs all throughout the Bible that when people see something that looks good and they take it because in their own eyes it looks better than following God, it leads to destruction. And so in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah sees he's confronted with his own sin and he turns to God. And in Isaiah 7, we're going to see the king Ahaz is confronted with the decision as well. Will he listen to God or will he do what is right in his own eyes and try and take and solve his own solution? So I'm going to have some people come up and we're going to read the different parts of Isaiah. Feel free to follow along together. If you guys want to come up and grab a, grab a microphone, we have several different readers, some students and uh, some adults, people who are part of our youth ministry as well as part of pe people who are part of our, uh, our young adult immersed group. So we'll be reading Isaiah chapter 7. And the word should be on the screen as well if the, the PowerPoint's working. I'll do my best to follow along. When Ephraim, son of Jatham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, king Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ephraim and his people were shaken, as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, to your um, Jacob, and meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool, on the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, be careful, be calm, and do, don't be afraid. Do not lose heart. Because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram, and the son, son of Remaliah, Aram, um, Ephraim, and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, let us invade Judah. Let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves and make the son of Tabil king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samira, and the head of Samira is only Remaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in all your faith, you will not stand at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ephraim. the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ephah said, I, I won't ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows how to, when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. In that day, the Lord will whistle for flies from the Nile Delta in Egypt and for bees from the land of Assyria. They will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the crevices in the rocks, on all the thorn bushes and at all the water holes. In that day, the Lord will use a razor hired from beyond the Euphrates, the king of Assyria, to shave your head and private parts and to cut off your beard also. In that day, a person will keep alive a young cow and two goats. And because of the abundance of the milk they give, there will be curds to eat. All who remain in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, in every place where there were a thousand vines worth a thousand silver shekels, there will be only briars and thorns. Hunters will go there with bow and arrow, for the land will be covered with briars and thorns. 
as for all the hills once cultivated by the hoe. You will no longer go there for fear of the briars and thorns. They will become places where cattle are turned loose and where sheep dwell. Thank you, guys. Uh, you can be seated. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that as we read this passage, um, where it just kind of seems like there's a lot of stuff that seems really foreign to us. There's a lot of stuff that might kind of seem, uh, in, in some cases, irrelevant to our life. Uh, we pray that you would help us see. Help us to see so that we would know what it means for us when we're confronted with this challenge of what do we do when something looks good in our own eyes, of what it means to stand firm, to not lose hope, and to trust you. Amen. Amen. So as we read that story, one of which may have been familiar to parts of you, and maybe there's a lot of it where you hadn't heard that before, we're, confront we're, we're, we're seeing this picture. If you want to imagine Ahaz looking out over his kingdom, maybe you know it, he's in his house and he's looking out the window. In this story, he's actually at a water source because he's making sure that his people have enough water because as he looks out on his kingdom, all he can see are two nations that are on his doorstep threatening him. One of these nations is an area that we would call modern-day Syria. The other nation is their family. It's the northern tribes of Jerusalem. These two nations of Aram and Damascus have joined forces to create a coalition of protection so that the superpower that is next door, the nation of Assyria, as they go to make war on another superpower, Egypt, that as they do this, as they walk from the north down, they will be protected. And they say to Judah, join us. And then the text also says the reason why they wanted them to join is so that they could actually overthrow the king of Judah. And so Ahaz is faced with this dilemma. All he can see is a threat. And so Isaiah comes to him. Isaiah is God's messenger. He's God's prophet. Comes to him, and he wants them to see, even though all he can see is a threat that is on the outside, and everything within him is struggling to figure out, how do I solve this problem? How do I protect myself? How do I make sure that I stay in power? Isaiah wants Ahaz to see that God's promise that he is with them is still true. Because he knows in Ahaz's heart, Ahaz is tempted to go to Assyria and ask them for help. So there's a lot of political intrigue. I mean, when you think about everything that's going on in our world today with coalitions and alliances and people wanting to make sure that this country has their back, it's happening here too. And when, I, I, when Ahaz is, is faced with this question of, do I go and ask Assyria for help? God has told them very specifically, one of the things that the kings are supposed to do as a way of showing their faith in me is to not go to other nations. In fact, it's one of the things that if you could summarize whether or not the nation of Israel is being faithful to God, there's three things that you could look at. Number one, are they worshiping other gods? Th that's an obvious one. Other one, are they oppressing the poor? Are they chewing up widows and orphans that the, so that they can make more money? And third, are they seeking political alliances with other countries? And God says that if you do those things, and those are visible representations of you not trusting me. You are not being faithful. So for Ahaz to seek out Assyria's support is actually showing a lack of trust that Ahaz has, Ahaz has in his faith towards God. He, by him going to Assyria or being tempted to go to Assyria is his way of saying, I don't trust God. When I see this external pressure on me, do I trust God to be enough? Do I trust that God will keep his promise to me? Or do I feel like I need to look somewhere else to solve my own problems? And God knows that when people start to do this, when they start to look for other nations' help, 
what's going to happen is that those other nations are going to lead everybody away from following God. When God tells his people, don't make political alliances with people, it's not because God is, like, jealous. I mean, there are passages where God talks about him being jealous. But it's not just that God wants Israel all to himself and forget everybody else. But the reason why God says you can't make a treaty with these people is because he knows, Israel, I have given you a very specific pur purpose. You are to be my holy people. You are to be set apart to show this world what it looks like to be God's people. Not so that they can just keep themselves away from everybody and exist in some sort of holy huddle, which is oftentimes what people think holiness means. But their holiness, their being set apart, was meant to bring people in so they could find out who this God is. And God knows that if you go to the nations looking for their help, rather than you drawing them in and trusting the God of Israel, they're going to draw you away from me. And you're going to continue to walk away from me. You're going to continue to oppress other people because you see them as objectives on how to make more money or how to keep political power. God says, if you walk away from me, this will happen to you. You are to be my holy people. And when you start to trust in other nations, you lose that distinction. So God's servant, you see this a lot in the scriptures, God's servant goes to the ruler of the day with a challenge. Are you going to follow God? Are you going to listen to him? Or are you going to do what is right in your own eyes? Now, last week I had mentioned that in our Sunday school, we had talked about how there's that passage in Exodus where it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, here, there almost is that parallel where it's like Isaiah becomes Moses and Ahaz, the king of Judah, becomes Pharaoh. God's messenger is coming to him and saying, are you going to listen? Are you going to trust God? Or are you going to try and solve your own problems? Or are you going to continue to reject God? Just like Moses told Pharaoh. And God is like, at this point, he's, he's kind of like, no, seriously, ask me for any sign, any proof that I am with you, any proof that I am faithful to my promise. And, I, and King Ahaz, in sort of this like smoke and mirrors, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to sit there, I'm going to do what looks religious, but in my heart, I'm just so far from God, like I could just be anywhere else right now. Ahaz, in his heart, is that way. He says, far be it for me to put the Lord to a test. It sounds very spiritual, but in reality, what he's saying is like, I've already decided that I'm not going to trust God. I've already decided that no matter how much God is begging me to, to, to prove to me that I'm here, I'm fighting for you, I haven't given up on you, I don't want it, I don't care. I've decided what is right in my own mind, and I don't care what God has to say. It's interesting that the king of Judah has become like Pharaoh. Instead of a son of David, he's become like the Pharaoh, rejecting God, saying, I don't know who God is. I don't care. I want to do things my way. And so then God brings, brings about this good news, bad news situation. He says, good news, good news, Ahaz. You're going to get a sign whether you want it or not. And you don't want it, but I'm going to give you a sign. The Lord himself, he says, will give you a sign. You will see that I keep my promise, that I can be trustworthy. God, time and time again, is just bent on getting his people to understand, you can trust me. I am for you. My will for you is good, even if it means you have to resist that urge to reach out and try and grab something on your own that you think will solve your problems for you, that you think will help you get ahead. God says, even if you have to resist that, that temptation, that challenge, what I have for you is so much better. You know, we, um, in my training as a, as a pastor and as a chaplain in the military, you kind of do mock scenarios of counseling and one of the tools and tricks that you give is like when you're doing a counseling session, you ask the miracle question. If you could wake up tomorrow and all of your problems have gone away, or this mirror, like something has happened that fixed your life, 
how would your life look different? You know, maybe if you're talking about a dysfunctional relationship, you're like, my spouse will start to listen to me, or my parents will get off my back and trust me that I'm actually doing my homework and not staring at TikTok as much as, you know, is understandable. And so it, Isaiah is saying, I'm giving you that miracle question because the very thing that you're worried about is going to be gone. And you don't have to do anything about it. You just have to trust. What you're uh, so afraid about right now is not going to be around in the, anymore. And I think many of us can understand that feeling where it's like there are challenges in our life that seem so overwhelming and just all-consuming in our life that we're just like, it seems like we can't see past this problem. You know, maybe as a student, it's a test coming up or a pressure because you feel like you're not really included in the group where you want to be. Or as an adult, you're faced with a challenge at work and it seems like all consuming. And yet six months later, you look back and you're kind of like, I can't believe I wasted so much emotional energy on that because it worked out. I think if we're honest, we all have those, those things. And so Isaiah is saying, what you're so worried about right now, it's not going to be around anymore. God himself will give you a sign. A virgin will have a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. So in the context of this promise, Ahaz is saying, at this point right now, there is a young unmarried woman who in the future will have a child. There's nothing miraculous about this this promise being given. It's just saying there is a young unmarried woman who would most likely be a virgin in that context, like will not, would not have had sex with a man. So she was a technical, by definition, virgin. But in the future, she will have a child. And this child, by the time that child has grown up, the thing you're so afraid of is gonna be gone. And I want you to see that when you see that, it means that God is with us. God is here. But here's the bad news of that promise. Because Aram and Ephraim are going to be the least of your problems. They're going to be the least of your worries. Why? Because Assyria is coming. The very thing that you want to reach out to protect, to protect you the very thing that you are looking to for what we would call salvation, when you read in the Bible and it talks about salvation and saved in the context of the Hebrew Bible, it's talking about being rescued from physical human enemies. So the very people that you're looking to for your salvation are going to become your enslavers. Ahaz, Ahaz has given a warning. God is going to give you what you want. Ahaz, what you are setting your heart on to rescue you, God will give it to you. What you are offering your heart's allegiance to, God will let you have it. You see this all throughout the storyline of the Bible, that God's judgment on people, God's wrath, God's anger, is pictured as, the, as God giving people what they want, rather than him. If you're not going to rely on me to secure you, then I'm going to hand you over to the very people who you want to, sa to save you, but they're going to become your enslavers. They're going to become your destroyers. They're going to become your oppressors. And the Apostle Paul picks up this idea later in the book of Romans in chapter 1. He talks about how the wrath of God is being revealed in the world because people have rejected him. They've exchanged the glory that God has designed for us to share in as his image bearers, and we've sought to find glory someplace else. And the way that God shows that he is punishing for us for that is by letting us do what we want, by handing us over to the things that we choose rather than God. And I think many of us can, there, there's a sense to where we can see this in our life. We think about things like, you know, maybe drug addiction or just getting caught up in, in something to where it's like you look for it to solve your problems, whether it's to help you fit in, whether it's to help you deal with stress. And ultimately what it does is it takes over your life. Like we see those extreme examples and we think, yeah, that one makes sense. But ultimately it's not just the extreme examples. It's whatever we set our hearts on, whatever we see 
that looks good in our eyes, that we reach out and take rather than trusting in who God is, that ultimately becomes the thing that enslaves us. That becomes our control. And God issues the warning that if you want that more than him, he will give it to you. And so Isaiah is saying to Ahaz, stand firm, don't reach out. Resist the urge to seize power according to what you think is right. And ultimately what this shows is the same thing that all of us are confronted with. That when we are confronted with the challenges, am I going to trust in what God has made me for? Who God has made me to be as his image bearer? Will I trust that for my security, for my identity, my source of love and acceptance? Or will I reach out and take something that I think looks good, but will ultimately enslave me? And so even though this, prom this story takes place thousands of years ago, maybe we see a little bit more of Ahaz in ourselves than maybe we would care to realize, care to admit. But the good news about this story is that this is not a story where it just kind of ends because, you know, God's king couldn't trust God and that's the end of it. Because ultimately what God wants us to realize is that God is true to his promise. Earlier we asked this, narr this narrative tension, how will God keep his promise to fix what is wrong in this world when even the very people who he chose to be his rescuing agents to the world are just as corrupt as everybody else? Well, we see the answer to God's promise to us in the person of Jesus. God in the flesh. How is God going to rescue this world? Well, he himself is going to come in the person of Jesus, who wasn't a mighty king. He wasn't a political, influential Fortune 500 ruler. He was a poor, physical laborer from a poor, no-name family living in kind of the countryside. And yet we see in this totally unimpressive person the answer to God's problem, the answer to God's promise. And this story that we read so often in Christmas says, but after Joseph had considered this, finding out that Mary was pregnant, and at that point Mary was a technical virgin. She had not had sex. They were unmarried and so she was the true sense of the virgin birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived of in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now we ask people who want to become followers of Jesus to believe in some pretty, some pretty strong things. We ask you to believe that the incarnate, the, the God in the flesh, proof that God is here and that he loves this world and the person of Jesus was born from somebody who hadn't had sex yet. So of all the natural ways that children are born, remove that from the equation and we ask you to trust that this is how the birth of Jesus came about. All of this took place. She will give birth to a son and you will, call, you will give him the name Jesus because he will save people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So in this passage in the gospel according to Matthew, Matthew takes that promise that was given 700 some odd years before Jesus was born about how God was going to send somebody as a proof that he is temporarily going to save his nation of Judah from their political enemies if they would dr just trust him. And he applies that promise to Jesus to say, it is Jesus who will save us, who will rescue us, not just the nation of Israel, but all of humanity, not from political enemies, but from our greatest enemy of sin and death. 
in Jesus, we see God's fulfillment to that psalm we read in the beginning about the true and faithful king. Do you notice how those two kings are set up in parallel towards each other? We spent so much time talking about how Ahaz was not faithful, did not trust God. When he saw the pressures of remaining faithful, he chose to reach out and try to grab power according to what he thought was right. Compare that with Jesus, the person who every single moment of his day, when he was confronted with the challenges of, am I going to trust God and be faithful to who he has called me to be, rather than reaching out and trying to grab power according to his own decisions, he always trusted God. Jesus is the true and obedient king who always was faithful to God. And through his faithfulness, as the, books, uh, the book of Philippians talks about, about how Jesus was obedient, even to the point of death on the cross, it is this death on the cross in our place that Jesus not only forgives our sin, the offense that our rejecting God has, has set as a block in our relationship with God, separating us from us, but Jesus also defeats the power of sin in this world where that evil no longer has that same control over us so that when we are confronted with the challenge of am I going to believe God am I going to trust him or am I going to reach out and try and grab things according to my own wisdom through the power of Jesus and the death of sin the breaking power of sin in our life we are able to stand firm to not reach out to trust that God is enough for us. And so this passage, even though, again, it was written so long ago, it reminds us of the human dilemma that we all face. Am I going to trust God when I'm confronted with maybe the calls of this world to seek power according to their means, to view my understanding with my friends in a way that I always seek to gain authority and, and privilege and position or where I want to use my body according to how I feel I want to use it? Or will I trust God and how he's designed me to be? So again, we're faced with this dilemma of, okay, what does this look like in our life? Some people call it applying the sermon. I think applying it sounds too technical, like it's a math term, that if you just do the problem and apply the solution, then it's going to work out just fine. And I understand why we say that, because it's, it's, it's the food we've been raised on in preaching. So let's think about it not so much in terms of applying, but let's think about it in terms of responding. How do I respond to this? What does it look like for me in trying to be faithful to follow Jesus when I'm confronted with whatever it is in my life, the pressures of this world, the doubts of my heart, the fears, am I going to try and reach out and grab on to something that I think will save me? I will reach out to do what I think is good in my own eyes? Or will I stand firm? Will I not lose heart? What does obedience look like? What does following Jesus look like? Because even in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul says, like, look, everything that happened before us was meant to serve as an example because everything that you're tempted with, people have been tempted with before. You can respond by either saying, I'm going to follow God, even though it may cost me, even though it may mean I don't reach out to take what I think is good, or you can reject God. So what does it look like for us to believe that Jesus is the true king? Jesus is the king who saves us from the power of sin and death in this world. Jesus is the one that through his death and resurrection actually gives us new life. I would just say that what does it look like for us to live as Jesus as the king is to follow Jesus when he tells us on the Sermon on the Mount, 
what it looks like to seek the kingdom of God. Did you notice about how everything that Jesus tells his followers to do is independent of your social situation in life? Doesn't matter if you're rich, doesn't matter if you're poor, doesn't matter if you're a man, doesn't matter if you're a woman, doesn't matter if, you know, insert whatever socio demographic this world tells you defines you and who you are. Jesus says it doesn't matter who you are, but what matters is, are you the ones who will seek first the kingdom of God? Are you going to be the one who, when you are confronted with something in your life, where you are faced with this reality, am I, going, am I going to reach out and grab and try and solve my own problems? Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who weep and mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be satisfied. These are the people who seek first the kingdom of God. And so if you're looking for a practical response, I would just encourage you to go back to Jesus' own teaching about what it means for us to follow him. Because so much about it isn't just something that we categorize into our daily Bible quiet time reading, though that's important, it's helpful. It is about how we live our lives to show that rather than seeking to reach out and grab what we think is good and true and right, rather we are the ones who hunger and thirst after righteousness. That even when we are tempted to be anxious, because maybe we look out the windows of our life and we see the enemies on our doorstep, rather than being anxious, we are the ones who trust God, that he will provide for us, and that we will seek his kingdom. You know, Jesus even follows up on this warning that is written all throughout the Hebrew scriptures, that ultimately whatever our hearts are drawn to, whatever we choose to worship, God will give us. Jesus talks about the response that God gives to people who continually reject him more than we realize. And so Jesus has warnings for people who continue to hear the word of God say, and say, I don't want to follow, I don't want to believe, I don't want to trust. And at the end of our life and in time, God will respond that if that is our heart's attitude, God will give us exactly what we want. He says, you did not want me in your life, and so now you will not enter my presence. But the good news of that is that Jesus even goes to say that, it, again, it doesn't matter who you are, you're, whether you're male or female, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, whether you are opposed and slandered by the rest of this world and you feel like you're alone, all Jesus has to say to you is that if you take up my cross and you follow me, if you seek the kingdom of God in your own life, it doesn't matter how weak your faith may be or how may you be d dealing with doubts and struggles and fears, that if you every day take up your cross, Jesus says, you will find life. You will inherit life in Jesus because Jesus is the king who has conquered death. He has paid the debt that our sin is owed. He has made us pure. He has fixed what is wrong in our relationship with God by doing everything we could never do so that through his resurrected power, we could follow God. We could seek the kingdom of God rather than reaching out and grabbing what we think is right and true and good in our own eyes, we instead choose to fix our eyes on Jesus who shows us what it's like to live in God's kingdom with Jesus as the King of Kings. We're going to sing King of Kings as a response song. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up, uh, but let me, let me pray quickly. Jesus, we thank you that you are the King who has conquered sin and death you are the king who has paid for the penalty of our sin through your, your death, and you are the king who has given us life through your resurrection. Help us then to see you, the risen king, as worthy of our trust. We know, God, that there are so many things in our life that may cause us to wonder, will I trust God or will I try and provide my own solution? 
we thank you, God, that your grace is always there for us when we, when we realize that we failed. Your blood has always made us clean. Your love is always faithful. And you are the king of our life. We thank you for your faithful love.